Good afternoon and welcome to ISBI SoCal. This is one of our regular diversity, equity, inclusion fireside chats, and we're so excited to have you join us. We're also very excited to have Tamika Ellington, PhD. Dr. Tamika, we are so excited to hear more about you and your book and the wonderful world of textures and differences in ability. Dr. Ellington. Thank you very much. Um, it's so wonderful to be here. And it's so nice to see so many people that I know um, on to um, hear me present today and to um, you know, be with me in this conversation. So I really appreciate you coming. And so I'm gonna be talking today about the need for diversity and inclusivity in art, beauty, and museums. And so in regards to what I do and who I am, um, I am a fashion professor. Um, I'm a fashion scholar. All the work that I've been doing has been centered around uh, underrepresented people in dress. And it's been an interesting ride. I've learned a whole lot on this journey. But some of the things that I have noticed is that uh, there are different ways in which people understand beauty and what beauty is supposed to be, or there are certain ways that people understand art and what it's supposed to be. And I was very adamant when I first began on my journey that I wanted to be specific in doing my work based on Africana studies, um, African-American heritage, um, African culture, dress, and I often use African fables as a part of the inspiration that I um, um, use as a, as a muse for my work. And I remember in the very beginning when um, I was making that decision, I had a mentor of mine. I'm a huge advocate for uh, mentors. You should always have someone that can help guide you through whatever you're trying to do in this life. It's always best to have somebody that's been there before you. And my mentor at the time, she was probably one of the very first um, scholars in my field who was a black um, scholar. And she told me straight up, she said, you know what? Um, I really wanna make sure that you can get tenure and promotion. And so when you're in academia, tenure and promotion is like the, um, the pie in the sky. That's what all academics um, aim to att attain. And so when I was talking to her about it, you know, she said, well, I really want you to be able to get tenure and promotion, but if you do Africana or Pan-African um, studies as your muse for your work, um, I'm." fearful that you won't get tenure promotion because the work that we do is not valued as much as everyone else. And, you know, I had to sit on that and think about that for quite a while and, and, and try to figure out, okay, am I going to do what it is that I love or am I going to do what's going to help get me tenure and promotion? And so I decided to do what I love. Thank goodness, you know, it worked out for me. Um, I've been um, awarded as one of the top researchers in my field, uh, which is amazing. And, you know, it's just because I want to be a, a representative of what it means to, um, to be someone who is strong and, and an advocate for those who are underrepresented. And so in the work that I've been doing, my mission has been to champion for the relevancy and importance of art that represents the underrepresented. I've always, in the work that I've been doing, tried to initiate empathy and human connectivity, as well as to help people see beauty differently, because the way that we see beauty right now is such a narrow lens. And I've always, you know, set out to try to do things a little bit differently. And so uh, back in 2016, I actually had my very first uh, solo show that I did. All the works that were in this particular show were pieces that I had designed and constructed, dyed fabrics, printed, digital prints, you know, um, all the leather work that I've done in my, in my career. So this particular exhibition was um, installed by me and it was um, entitled Retold, the Reinterpretation of African Fables into Fashion. And so every single piece in this particular exhibition had some kind of storyline behind it, some type of uh, fable 
informed each one of those pieces. And so the exhibition came about, it went awesome. This was a space, um, a gallery space that's um, in our Pan-African Studies Department at Kent State University. And so these are just some images of what the final installation uh, looked like. And as I was saying, you know, everything that I do is, is based on a story. And so during the um, exhibition, I thought that it was very important for me to be able to talk about the work and to be able to tell a story and, and help people understand the richness uh, that is African culture and the beauty that is African culture. And one of the things that was so important to me was to tell stories of people who may not necessarily have been told in the same space where I was in the, in the academia space that I was privileged enough to be a part of. And so I wanted to make sure that they knew where African beauty came from. They knew that African beauty, you know, was something that was authentic, something that was uh, real and something that was relevant and, and, and a needed to be um, showcased. And so as a champion for the relevancy and importance of art and beauty that represents the underrepresented, um, art and beauty are direct derivatives of society, which is a represent, representation or representative of Western ideas and white supremacy. The non-white perspective is oftentimes excluded or hidden. That happens and shows up in education and curriculum. Oftentimes we see that when um, universities um, have their art programs, the history that they tell is usually a European or Westernized uh, history. In education, we find in art education or whatever the education field may be, many times uh, the curriculum is focused on the achievements of non um, people of color or non-BIPOC um, people. And so the, the, the contributions that people of color have made to whatever that particular industry might be, oftentimes is hidden. They don't know anything about what's happened. And so they have to kind of go find out that information on their own. There's something called the ugly law. Uh, and in the research that I've been doing, I discovered this, and this was something that um, I discovered when I was in the process of developing with my co-curator, um, Dr. Stacy Lim. Uh, we were working on developing the concept for uh, the exhibition called Disabled Beauty. And I'll talk a little bit about that in just a little bit. But when I discovered that there was actually a law that prohibited people who had a visible physical disability that actually prohibited those people from being a part of society. It made it so that those individuals had to uh, stay in their home. So if their body was asymmetrical in any way, if they were quote unquote unattractive to the rest of mainstream society, they were, it was law that their families had to keep them in the house. That law did not actually um, end until the 1970s, Chicago, Illinois, was the very last city to, um, to, to basically ban um, the ugly law in its legislation. And we all know that historically black bodies have been animalized. Black bodies have been, um, have been enslaved and abused and the rationale behind you know, allowing these things to happen in regards to mainstream society is that we're not human anyway. We're, we're you know, we have um, animal-like features, woolly hair or monkey-like features. And so because that was the dominant ideology about Black beauty and Black bodies, that made it okay for Black people to be disenfranchised and taken advantage of. And so Disabled Beauty uh, was developed um, with, like I said, my, my um, co-curator, Dr. Stacey Lim. She and I wanted to really focus on helping to push past the paradox of what it meant to be 
someone who is beautiful, who just so happens to be someone who also has a disability. And oftentimes when you hear the word disability and beauty, you don't necessarily hear those in the same sentence. They're almost kind of like a, a, a opposite. You know, it's a, a contrast because when you, you know, when society thinks of someone who is beautiful, that person can't possibly also uh, be someone of intelligence, someone of beauty. And so there becomes the, um, you know, the underlying issue uh, in which society has about people who are, um, who have different abilities. And so with the exhibition, it was really important for us to um, give a breadth of the assistive devices that were available to people um, who had different abilities. And so because of the fact that my background is in fashion, I wanted to definitely be able to highlight, you know, some of the clothing that were on the market available to people who were wheelchair users or people who had other um, um, different abilities that they may need um, assistance with. Um, so we even, you know, were able to get conceptualized pieces that were um, really inspired by either someone who uh, needs that particular functionality of the clothing or um, was really inspired by people who live that day to day. And this particular piece was one of our favorite pieces. Uh, the designer that created this piece, she has a hearing loss. She wears a hearing aid. She was a student at University of Minnesota and I had gone there for a conference. And I was talking to some of my colleagues about the exhibition that um, I had been working on. And they told me, they said, you got to meet this young lady. You know, she's making this really amazing dress. And she used her hearing aid batteries as part of uh, the design and the dress. And, and so once we saw the piece, you know, we, we knew we wanted to make sure that we had it in the show because it just shows the, the lifespan of, you know, what this young lady um, was living with and how something that we oftentimes see as unattractive can turn into something that's absolutely beautiful. And with Disabled Beauty, we wanted to give the, the breadth of history as well as what's happening in contemporary assistive devices. So these pieces were uh, ones that were um, back from like the early 1900s. And we have pieces from the 1950s. Uh, many times, um, you know, when we were doing our research, it was obvious that devices back then were used, um, were, were meant to be hidden. Um, they were meant to be out of sight. And so this particular piece that you see, um, the little satin pouch looking um, item is actually a case that uh, would, you would put your, um, the transistor or the, the battery pack for a hearing device, you would actually slip that into that little pack and you can attach it to your brassiere and a woman could wear that and she could basically, you know, her hearing device could be as discreet as she wanted it to be. And so we found that, you know, historically hiding hearing devices was what the um, wearer uh, was wanting to do. But Dr. Lim and I really wanted to focus on the fact that those things are beautiful, that they are a part of who you are and it's a part of um, your identity. And so it should not be hidden. It should be something that is celebrated and, and shown and showcased. And so we looked at, uh, you know, historic canes, contemporary canes, uh, clothing. Uh, we looked at um, items that were like prostheses or, um, accessories for prostheses. And like I said, you know, looking back at historical items, uh, we had a prosthetic, the one that's laying on the, um, on the platform. That particular prosthetic was actually given to us by uh, a family whose father, the patriarch in the family, he was a part of the, um, I think the Civil War, or World War II, I can't remember, but he had lost his um, limb in the war and had worn this prosthetic. And this piece was a part of, you know, American history. And so we really wanted to showcase that. And again, of course, looking at the contemporary and what is happening right now um, with um, prosthetics and how those pieces are actually beginning to become something that is seen, meant to be seen and not something that's meant to be hidden. 
There's companies such as Enable who also work with uh, people who have uh, the need for a prosthetic hand. Prosthetic hands can be very, very expensive, especially those robotic ones. And so they were wanting to figure out a way to, to service those individuals with beautiful pieces that they can wear and be able to have some um, mobility within that. And Enable also you know, does pieces specifically for children. And so Dr. Lem and I really wanted to highlight, uh, highlight the beauty in that. We wanted to have a lot of fun. Uh, with our exhibition. And so that's a picture of Dr. Lem and I when we were um, just about ready to, uh, you know, showcase the disabled exhibition, um, disabled beauty exhibition to the Central Michigan um, audience. And uh, we were lucky that Toothless, the um, wheelchair surround was able to travel with us. So Toothless, um, when we first opened up Disabled Beauty, it was featured at Kent State University. It stayed there for um, almost a year. We moved it um, to Central Michigan and it stayed there for uh, about eight months or so, but we were able to bring Toothless with us. So Toothless was a major part of our show. We loved um, being able to see um, people's reactions to how a company called the Magic Wheelchair, how they use art and beauty as a way to celebrate their children um, who are wheelchair users. Um, during this particular exhibition, we also had a lot of programming and we wanted to invite people who wouldn't necessarily come to museums and wouldn't necessarily, you know, be willing to show off their prosthetics. And so we invited those individuals to come and to be able to celebrate and to be able to show the amazing attributes of the prosthetic limbs that they have. And um, during that particular show, we also had speakers and it was very important for us to be able to highlight and celebrate the um, designers or the manufacturers that were making these assistive devices for people um, who needed them. And so that was Disabled Beauty. Um, in regards to initiating empathy and human connectivity, um, you know, when you think about that, you can kind of um, think about it in a way of um, the author of A Brave New World when he said, we can only love what we know and we can never know completely what we do not love. Love is a mode of knowledge. And what that basically means is that people um, as human beings, uh, in regards to having an attachment to something, we can really only have an attachment to something that we're familiar with. And what I've been trying to do with all the work that I've done is to be able to bring people into a space that they may not normally have been able to have access to, to be able to get to understand different types of people so that they can you know, create some kind of um, understanding and empathy uh, for, for, for others accessibilities to museums and museums can allow the community to see themselves in the work promoting connectivity. So it's the museum's job to whatever they're exhibiting in their show, it's their job to make sure that whomever's going to be viewing that show can actually look at a piece and, and be able to see themselves reflected in that piece. And that's another way that museums can help uh, bridge that human connectivity. Museums can provide a space for greater understanding of the human race. Understanding equals empathy, which can turn, uh, which in turn helps to create relationships. And um, as we know, relationships are a major part of, um, of our world and in a way that um, we can better get along with each other. And um, I have a new exhibition that I'm working on right now. This exhibition is um, co-curated um, by myself and uh, Professor Dr. Joseph Underwood. He's an African art historian and we are gonna be presenting textures. It'll open next year. And with textures, we will be able to increase diversity at the Kent State University Museum and invoke an understanding of the black hair struggle. And I think um, one of the things that was so important for us because uh, the Kent State University Museum is at Kent State, of course, which is a predominantly white institution. Most of the people that go to the museum are white people, older white people to be precise. And we wanted to find an exhibition that would um, not only um, 
tell a story, but also invite other people who not necessarily would have had access to come to the Kent State University Museum to actually have a reason to come. And so with textures, uh, we've devised three different themes that will be featured in that show. We wanted to show artwork and artifacts that represent Black love, hair politics, community, and memory. And these are just a couple other pieces that will be featured in the show. We were blessed enough to be able to get uh, some awesome, awesome, well-known uh, um, artists to um, allow us to have their works in our show. And so uh, we got a beautiful painting by Kehande Wiley, this amazing uh, painting, lithograph, um, sculptural kind of piece from Mary Sabande. And we um, have actually had to build our entire exhibition just around that platform. Because as you can see, it's a very large platform that the artist created for that particular piece. And so our whole exhibition has been built around that. And in uh, textures, we're going to be looking at a lot of the history, because just like with Disabled Beauty, it was important for us to show the history, as well as to show what's happening in contemporary art. And so with textures, we're going to show a lot about the history of Black hair. We were blessed enough because Dr. Joseph Underwood has some connections with art museums across the nation. We were lucky enough to be able to get some ancient Egyptian pieces that will be shown um, in our textures exhibition. So we're going to be able to show from the ancient Egyptian times all the way to uh, contemporary into our contemporary world, what people are doing uh, with black hair and how they're celebrating and taking care of um, black hair. So textures was actually supposed to open uh, this fall, but of course, because of the pandemic, we thought that it was important for us to push it back because we want it to be a big deal. We want to be able to showcase textures in a way that people can come in and, and see up close. We did not want to have to do a virtual um, exhibition, though I'm sure a lot of people are now doing that kind of thing, but textures was so important to us that we felt that it was um, critical that people see it up close, be able to be in, in that experience, you know, be able to walk in that experience, be you know face to face with some of that art and some of those art um, archives. And so we decided to push it back to next year. But in the process of creating textures, we also developed a book. And so the textures, uh, his, the history and art of black hair uh, table book, which is a beautiful book that showcases all of the art pieces that will be shown in textures. And so now uh, the book is available. You can purchase it at the Kent State University Museum website. And um, many of my friends and others who have been interested in uh, this process and what I've been working on with this, you know, have been able to celebrate and, and um, learn more about textures by um, purchasing the book. And one of the things that, you know, as I continue on as an artist and as I continue on as a, a curator, you know, I look back at my childhood and I have a, an understanding that there's uh, an issue of museums being underused. Poor BIPOC people don't usually visit the museum. This image um, that you see is a um, image of the Cleveland Art, the Cleveland Museum of Arts. Um, it's their courtyard and pond. I grew up in Cleveland. Uh, maybe 10, 15 minutes away from the art museum. Um, I never, as a child, never have ever gone in the art museum. I have been on the outside of the art museum uh, to um, do picnicking or, you know, my mom um, would take my brother, sister and I, you know, just a walk around the pond and things like that. But actually being able to have access to art museums or to the orchestra or symphony or, or whatever, you know, may, you, you know, it may be, that is something that's considered, you know, very high, um, high society, cultural kinds of experiences, you know, I didn't get the chance to really experience those things until I became an adult. Or if I did experience those things, oftentimes it was our school, our elementary school, maybe have gotten a grant or something and now they're able to you know be able to bring the students to these places so that they can get a little bit of a taste of what it's like being in those spaces but 
because of that, you know, museums are very much so underused. And I want to talk now a, a little bit about some of the things that museums can do to um, improve uh, some of the things that museums can do to better support um, others of um, people of color. And I want to talk about some of the mistakes that museums um, have made and will probably continue to make. And one of those is uh, performative allyship. Um, that's a terminology that's been uh, very, um, very much so in society nowadays. It's, uh, it's spoken up a lot about, you know, what's been happening um, with a lot of the protests that we've been doing. And, and it's been uh, something that, you know, Blacks and others who are advocates for um, Blacks have noticed that there are some people who not necessarily are um, for this um, Black Lives Matter movement or not necessarily for the equal treatment of Blacks. However, they've been performing as such. They've been performing as if they uh, truly care and if, as if they um, really want to see society change. And so museums have the responsibility of making sure that they are um, taking care of everyone who um, will eventually be able to come to their space. And performative allyship is something that they should definitely avoid because, you know, once, once it's put out there and, um, you know, you say certain things, but then you don't follow up with action. And that's what, that's what Black people are wanting right now is they want action. They don't want words anymore. And performative allyship is all about just the words that you say and what you say you're going to do, but you don't do. And another mistake that museums are making is the perpetual neutral spaces. Um, to perpetuate those neutral spaces, basically um, that um, I don't recognize um, um, the diversity or nor, or nor do they celebrate diversity in, in, in that they say things like, oh, I don't see color. Um, and when you don't see color, when you don't see difference, it's almost a way for you to, um, to give you a pass um, not to acknowledge the differences in people because yeah, you know, there are lots of differences, but those differences are wonderful and those differences are an asset whether rather than being a liability. And so museums trying to stay in neutral spaces where they're, you know, saying that they don't see color, that's a major mistake because they're overlooking the, 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 the glory and the, and the um, beauty that is um, artwork dedicated to um, people of color. And another mistake that are, the art museums are making and can, will continue to make is the continued lack of accountability for positive change. And um, I have a friend of mine, um, her name is Dr. Lauren Cross. She's actually um, a curator. She has in the past owned her own gallery. And I talked to her about this presentation. I said, you know, some of the things that I'm gonna be talking about, you know, are mistakes that museums make. And I, and I said, what's your opinion? I said, you know, as a gallery owner, as someone who, you know, works in these curated spaces, like what is your idea about something that museums are making a mistake in? And she said the, the, the lack of accountability. You know, again, that's that performative allyship, saying what you're gonna do, but then don't follow up. And that's a major, major issue. Um, this um, painting that you see on the screen is um, by an artist named Dana Schultz. She's a white artist. She created this piece called Open Casket, which is um, inspired off of the um, photograph of Emmett Till that was that went across the nation um, during his funeral because his mother elected to have an open casket so that the world could see what those individuals did to her child. And this particular um, white artist took it upon herself to, um, to try to, to, try to uh, show her, her level of wokeness. And in, and, in, and in doing so, you know, many black artists, you know, had issue about this. It's, it's, it was, they looked at it as, as if it were disrespectful, as if it were not a true connection to what the Black experience was. And it was just a way for this particular artist to try to put something out there that made, um, made, it, see, is, made it seem as though they you know, really understand what it's like to be a Black person. 
So some policies and procedures for initiating DNI uh, improvement in museums. And one of those things is the defining terms and learning the difference between internalized, interpersonal, institutional, and structural systemic racism. So once you are able to really call it out and say what it is, then that's when the change can start happening. And so people, a lot of times, um, you know, are clueless in many ways. And, and I think that's been part of the issue is that people who are um, not non-BIPAC non-BIPOC people um, oftentimes will say, well, I don't know what to do, or um, I don't really know how to help, or what can I do to help? And, and the issue has become that, again, Black people are left with the responsibility of having to educate instead of those individuals going out and educating themselves about how to make this society better. So if they can, for themselves, define terms understand what systemic racism is, they can then begin to try to try, um, try to start changing that. Another thing that they can do um, is establishing protocols for conversations because discussing racism is not easy. Like I said, people have a hard time with it. Um, there's a book that came out several years ago um, and it's just because of everything that's been going on, it has uh, sparked up again and has been hot on the market. And that book is, um, white fragility. Um, I can't remember the name of the author right now, um, but white fragility, the idea or the theory uh, behind what white fragility is, is basically the idea that, you know, white people have a hard time discussing issues of racism. They have a difficult time understanding what racism is because they don't want to have these conversations. And so if the museums within their staff, within the people that you know, patronize their spaces, if they can come up with a way to feel comfortable um, talking about these things, then we can hopefully be able to get over many of these uh, situations because if they're not talked about, nothing can be solved. Another thing that they can do is identify and analyze and hopefully rectify everyday examples of racism. And that um, painting that I just showed you by Dana Schultz is, an, is a prime example of racism that kind of goes unhidden, um, racism that um, sneaks underneath the, the, the radar, so to speak. And so it becomes museum's responsibility to really understand Black culture so that they can see that when art pieces are created, is this appropriation or is this a celebration of Black culture? Some of the social cultural improvements that museums can make is by continuing to connect with the community and surrounding inner cities uh, through programming. So having ways to invite the community to come to the museum, giving them reason to come. Um, because with you know exhibitions, if, they, if there's no reason, if there is no connectivity, as I was talking about before, then the people aren't going to want to come. And so creating programming around um, working with the community, servicing the community is a way that museums can help improve the patronage and diversify the patronage of their um, spaces. Another thing that museums can do is continue to offer free days. Many museums across the nation will have a free day during the week um, that is open to the public and you can come without having to pay. Um, and if they can continue to offer those free days and other incentives for visiting the museum, that's another way that they can continue to increase the numbers. But it's all about advertising because, you know, if you don't know that there are free days, um, I've lived in Akron, I live in Akron, Ohio. Um, there's a, a great museum here, the Akron Art Museum. And for many, many years, I knew nothing about their free days. They offer free admission days every Thursday evening. And I had been living in Akron for almost 10 years before I even found out about the availability of being able to go to the museum for free. And so they can start, you know, really being able to push that and advertise and, and give incentives for the community to come, then that can also help diversify their patronage. Scheduling and planning for exhibits that push people beyond their social cultural barriers um, or boundaries. Um, like the exhibition that I've been working on um, 
with Disabled Beauty and like the exhibition that I'll be showing coming up next year, um, Textures. We are, with those shows, we want to push beyond what society says is the norm. We want to push beyond what society says is art, what society says is beauty, and to be able to show a different perspective. And if museums can begin to schedule those kinds of things in their, um, in their spaces, more people will want to come because again, they'll be able to see themselves in the art. Another thing that they can do is install permanent collections that also include works by or focused on positive representation of BIPOC people or under other underrepresented groups. And that's so important because some museums will have installations that are permanent that no matter what time of year, no matter when you go, those particular exhibitions will always be available to be seen. And when you have a permanent installation, it's so important that that installation be something that everyone can be able to connect with. Everybody who comes to the museum will be able to see themselves um, in that work. And so installing these collections, installing these permanent collections with some representation of BIPOC people is something that museums definitely can do. And if all else fails, build your own. Black people over the years have had to consider, consistently build their own with magazines, publications, as, you, as we can see, you know, in the early 50s and 60s, uh, Jet Magazine and Ebony Magazine had to be created because Black people were not represented in other publications. Uh, television stations and networks, Black people, had to create their own because again, if black people were shown on TV, they were shown in stereotypical ways. They were shown uh, misrepresented for who, who they really are as a culture. And so they again had to, to build their own. And just as you know, in the early um, 1960s, the very first museum, African-American um, museum was founded by um, Margaret Taylor Burroughs because of the fact that Black history was not being told, was not being able to be seen uh, by others. And so she felt that it was very important that she built her own. And we were just so blessed, you know, in 2016 to have finally have gotten an adequate space, uh, a, a real space to be able to highlight the breadth of African-American history and culture. And so um, I would love to use this time now to um, invite any questions and dialogue that you might like to have with me. And I listed here um, ways that you can get in touch with me if you would like. And I'll stop sharing my screen so that we can have a dialogue.